Hello. Uh, we're at Mainland Nurseries today on the Welsh English border near Whitchurch in Shropshire. I'm with Andrew Henry. We're at Mayla Forest Nurseries here. It's the largest nursery, tree nursery in the country. Just give us some sort of scale and idea of how it fits within the sector. Okay, so uh, Mainland's based on two sites. We've got over 450 acres here. It was originally a forestry commission nursery many years ago in the 60s. Uh, we also have another production facility up near Nairn in Scotland. Uh, it's a natural microclimate there. Um, in terms of scale, we're about a third of the production of commercial forestry within the UK. Uh, but Mailer's made up of a number of things. We've got the R&D lab, uh, we've got the outdoor field production, we've got the mini plug production here, but we're also moving uh, rapidly into cell, larger cell or line of production um, to our advantage for mechanised planting, or also to allow us to extend the season that we plant in, because bare root planting is traditionally quite a narrow season, and with the climate change that we can see coming, we need to extend that season and, and plugs or liners work for that. And that climate change, we're already seeing that this year, the fields have been very, very wet. We then have uh, it's them being very cold. And it's meant that our window in which we can lift product has been massively curtailed. And so we're looking at strategies around how we try and resolve that going towards the future. Absolutely. So the business this year, normally uh, dormancy, uh, the way we normally work is we lift trees uh, in November, they will be graded and frozen, and then we will start shipping them out from late November onwards, and they're then shipping from a stop. Um, what's happened this year is the trees were not in a position to go into freezer store until mid-December, because the dormancy was much delayed, because it was much warmer. And then as we have been lifting, we've been getting very wet, wet conditions, as everybody's known, it's rained a huge amount this year. So we've had about 700 millimetres more rain than normal. So we've had to start thinking now about how we manage that going forward. So we're looking to investments in different lifting equipment, uh, potentially uh, optical grading, and also different ways of storing the plants so that actually we can lift earlier, but also manage the fact that trees haven't gone fully dormant. And where are our trees going to? It's essentially all over Britain. Um, yes, probably about 70% goes to Scotland, 20% uh, 20, 20 goes to Wales, depending where the replanting is or new forestation is and then the bulk of it goes to the rest of England. But because we're a commercial forestry nursery, you're principally going to the locations where commercial forestry is. Yeah. Andrew, we're inside this facility here that I think costs us about five million pounds. Perhaps you could tell us a bit, bit about it. Okay, so this facility was designed to grow mini plugs. Um, currently, the way that we grow trees is to seed in the, the soil outside then lift the transplants and then plant them, line them out, and then they grow. It's very inefficient, it's very expensive, and we waste a lot of seed. So the most efficient way to grow them is to grow individual little seeds in little plugs that are about that size in this facility, which we then transplant using robotic transplanters in the field. And we should get a much more even crop growth, so we grow the size of crop that we're looking for more predictably. <clears throat> okay, and this was a very large investment for this site. And it's really about a step change in technology and, and the generation of, of how we produce things and, and looking very much to the future. Absolutely. It's about learning and benefiting from the advances in horticulture and agriculture and transferring them to forestry so that actually we're in a position that we can utilise the best genetics, we can utilise modern techn technology such as robotics, and we can also make sure that we, for a business perspective, leverage the investment that we've got to make it as efficient as possible. And the last point is we use far less resources. So we use less water, we use less pesticides, and certainly here we can focus on using biocontrol methods to control pest and disease, rather than as we would do in the fields using agricultural pesticides. And that's been really interesting coming in here, and it's a sterile environment up to a point. And some of the things you've talked to me about, about using biological control rather than chemical control make the whole process much more sustainable. Uh, absolutely, because every time you spray a tree with an agrochemical, particularly it's a little tree, um, it stresses it and it damages it. And, and actually, when we think about it, do we want to be using chemicals if we can use natural substances? So th this environment, because it's enclosed, allows us to manage the, the water. It doesn't rain, we wait, rain it. We manage the light levels so we don't stress the plants too much. We can manage the feed in here so we can give the plant what it wants. So we take the stress away. And then when we do get pest and disease, because they come in naturally, we can then control them in a better way that's more in tune with the environment.
And when we do then use chemicals, which we do occasionally still have to use, they can be very targeted and we don't have to spray the whole crop. We can spray the little area where the problem is. And that's got to be better for us in the environment. And actually trees are sustainable, so let's try growing them sustainably. And how many trees are we ultimately going to end up growing here? We've got four hectares, five hectares? Yeah, we've got, we've got two and a half hectares, two four half acres. Hectares from, uh, four. So we're planning to grow this year about 29 million sitka plugs in here. That's in one sequential planting. But if we plant twice a year, we can grow double like that. That's and we're looking to do that by potentially increasing light levels. And we're doing experiments in moment with LEDs and these, these, these sort of things. There's an awful lot of innovation that goes on here. Every time I come in, the team are weighing boxes or trying a different application of a different product. It's, it's um, compared to outside, which feels much more like farming, we're in a much more um, structured environment, if that's the right term. Yeah, it is. And I think uh, here it's about day-to-day -day decisions outside. Here it's about hourly decisions. It's about how we manage that crop, but we can start using the technology. So we control the fertilizer, we measure the electrical conductivity, uh, we can manage the growth of the plants. You say with the light, the thing that stops us growing in the winter or growing for longer is, is light levels. So we've got LED lights, which you won't see as I'm pointing at over there, but LED lights that actually extend the day length here. And that means that we can then grow more plants. But the advantage of LED is we can then control the light frequency we give the plant so we can help manage the root growth as well as the growth on the top. And I think I'm right in saying one of the other benefits that this facility gives us is that we can allow it to scale up the sort of genetic improvements that we're starting to try and put into our, our, our trees. Absolutely. So we've got uh, seed orchards here uh, where we've got our own improved seed, Sitka particularly, but we've also got Douglas and we've got Birch and, and other crops. We've got the SC lab, so the somatic embryogenesis lab, where we can scale up genetics. So if you've got one cone with 100 seeds in it, we can scale those up to a much higher volume, which we can then grow in here. And that in here means that we use a small amount of seed, but we can scale it up much quicker, which then makes sure that we get those genetics out into the field and then out to the forest as quickly as possible. Yeah, and we talked about the lab there. We've got five, six people working in there, and that's really sort of cutting edge in terms of some things we've already been talking about, but there's a whole load of other changes that are coming towards the sector in terms of some of the different species we're starting to think about. And that's very much at the core of what we're trying to do here as, as we look to the future. Absolutely. So the, the team here are focused on looking at a future trees project. So we're looking at what trees, what traits those trees need, the environment that they're going to need to grow in, and also the disease and pest resistance. And the lab is looking at how we can um, use the genetics that we've currently got, how we cross those genetics, and then how we scale those genetics up to deliver those improvements in forestry. And what we're doing is speeding the natural process up. We're not doing anything that's out of the ordinary, we're just speeding it up. So the mini plug facility here we see is really <coughs> absolutely fundamental to uh, future timber production here, but perhaps you could talk a bit about why, why that is. Okay, so there's a number of reasons. The first is if you put 100 seeds in the ground, out in, the, out, out in the fields, you'll probably only get 50% of them germinating. And then when they are lifted, you've got to use labor to lift them, and then you have to plant those little seedlings in the field. Now, a number of things happen then, when those seedlings grow, they grow unevenly. So when you're actually looking for a core product, I, I use 40, 60 as an example. So that's a tree that's between 40 and 60 centimeters tall, which is sort of average of what the forest is looking for. We get a small proportion of trees in that size range. If you then come to the mini plug unit, um, we would look to get an 85% germination because that's what the seed germination is. Um, we can then use robotic transplanters in the field to transplant those plants, which means you're significantly reducing our labor requirement and cost. It also means that those plants grow much more evenly. So the size range that we're looking for essentially um, is more in line with where we're at. So instead of having 30% of the crop within that size, we should get 50 to 60% within that size range. The other thing that it allows us to do is use technology because if we robotically planted it, we can GPS locate them, which then means we can start monitoring the crop and managing the crop using the technology such as um, satellites, drones, uh, mapping the fields to make sure we give the, the, the plants the fertilizer required for that bit of the field rather than treating the whole field the same as an example. So for a mini plug, that gives us the option. The final bit is environmental management. We use less water, less pesticides and less area because to grow 26 million plants out there would require an awful lot of land. 
And that's land that we need to rotate so that we're managing the soil better, we're managing the soil health and keeping the organic matter up. And by removing this seed growing operation from the soil to here, that allows us to put those proper rotations in. And that's something I found really interesting. Again, getting involved in that soil health, something that I, I know about through forestry, but here we have to be much more um, aware of that. We've got a couple of agronomists who work on the site here and we're starting to do a whole process of, of mapping soils and digging soil pits and looking at soil fertility. And, and we're going to have a different regime here potentially of, of how we improve that soil health. Yeah, very much. I mean, historically, farming would be um, rotate a number of crops. So conifer, um, you might uh, rotate that with a broadleaf, but you might have a two year to three year rotation, but it's still trees. And what gradually happens is your organic matter levels drop, your soil fertility, natural fertility level drops, your natural fungal bacterial load, which is your positive fungus and bacteria to help the plants grow, the roots grow, give you a strong plant, start gradually dropping off. And essentially, everything you put in that soil, you've either dug it out of the ground or you've added it. So fertilizer you've added or pesticides. By managing the soil differently, putting rotations in, cover crops as we call them, to help add organic matter, and rotating, having a wider rotation between broadleaf and conifer crops, what we can actually do is let the soil regenerate itself to so improve the organic matter. We get the fungal and bacterial loads back to where the soil health is. And basically that gives us a stronger tree and we get better yield and it reduces our need for organic fertilizers and pesticides. If it's, if it's your life, in human terms, it's your gut bacteria. How do you manage that? You eat a bio run. <laughs> Okay, but in, we're not going to be eating with it. But the, the, the equivalent of bio yogurt is some clover crop. and what what other things? It could, could be clover, it could be vetch, it could be wildflowers. Yeah. Uh, it could even be things like barley because sometimes you want the roots to go down deep yeah. to break the soil yeah. structure up naturally. Things like that. So that's the equivalent of soil. Plus, if you grow a crop and you chop it up into little bits, a bit like your lawn mowing, if you mulch your lawn. That breaks down in the soil naturally, and you're adding organic matter straight back in. We've roped Ben in here, and Ben is going to tell us what's going on here. But first of all, Ben, introduce yourself to the world. Okay, so I'm Ben Go. I'm the commercial manager. Uh, my role at Baylor is to, I suppose, match what we grow to what we sell, and match what we sell to what we grow. So a lot of crystal ball gazing, a lot of talking to customers, understanding the market. Okay, so behind us we have what? Uh, so we refer to these as emblings, um, as opposed to seedlings, because they've grown from an embryo. And these have actually been produced from our somatic embryogenesis lab, and the embryos. So each tray you can see there is a different family. So it's a controlled cross where you go the mother, then you go the father. We've done the cross, but we only have a small number of seeds. So we put them into the somatic embryogenesis lab and clone them in a petri dish for all intents and purposes. So we turn one seed into a thousand trees. So each tree in a tray is a clone. And so these have been brought from the lab, uh, and they've been brought out here to harden off and to um, grow on in the same way that we're growing um, our seedlings in the mini tree. And I think you've got a really good analogy. You talk about the wild population being like, yeah. Yeah. You, it's your analogy, Ben. Okay, okay. If you have a wild population of anything, and, and bear in mind that a lot of the things that we take for granted nowadays, like potatoes, tomatoes, potato, whatever, bananas, they're all the result of quite intensive breeding. So that uniformity and actually those traits that you see, straight or, or bent, whatever you want in your banana, but those are a function of breeding. Whereas your wild population looks very different. And if you look at wild potatoes, they, they look pretty hideous uh, and they're not very good for making chips. So a wild population has a lot of diversity, has a lot of individuals in it, but what you want to do is you want to select the specific traits you're after and breed within that population. So then you can get straighter timber, you can get higher density, you get a better grade out of C16, for example, um, and you get more timber per hectare. And that's crucially what we're after uh, with the breeding that we're doing here. 